Uh, hello, everybody. Happy morning of Florida Drupal Camp. And uh, yeah, this is uh, envisioning a design system maintained by the Drupal community. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned before we started recording, uh, there, these slides are online along with uh, a few ad additional resources and some of the code examples we'll be looking at. Uh, and it's great to be back at uh, Florida Drupal Camp. I love this event. And uh, I am Brian Perry. I am a staff software engineer at Pantheon, uh, an initiative coordinator, or I guess maybe a former initiative coordinator, as we've kind of wrapped up most of our work, but for Drupal's decoupled menus initiative. I live in the Chicago suburbs. I love uh, Drupal, JavaScript, and Nintendo, and I even wore a t-shirt today to prove it. Um, uh, as far as games I'm playing, uh, great time to be a Nintendo fan. Uh, I'm playing uh, Mario plus Rabbids Sparks of Hope, which is uh, something I'm loving way more than I expected. And then they recently re-released my favorite game of all time, uh, Metroid Prime, a remastered edition, and it rules. Uh, I also own the domain webcomponents.wtf. Uh, I'm not, not doing anything with it, but I feel like since it's relevant to this topic, it still counts. Uh, online uh, in a variety of places and uh, would love to chat with you, although I think my days on Twitter might finally be over. Uh, so uh, the title of this talk again is Envisioning a Design System Maintained by the Drupal Community. So uh, we're going to start envisioning some things and asking some, uh, some what if questions to take us through this. So uh, what if? What if uh, there were a set of Drupal friendly components that anybody could use? You could use them in Twig, you could use them in your JavaScript framework of choice, and it was easy to extend these components or contribute new ones. Um, you know, obviously I'm uh, kind of seeding things here, but uh, that you know, sounds pretty great to me. <laughs> um, and what if web components made this possible? So when we're talking about web components here, specifically we're talking about the uh, core web platform APIs, and not necessarily the JavaScript frameworks like React and Vue, um, but we'll see how those play together. But uh, Web Components from this perspective is essentially three main APIs. Custom elements, the Shadow DOM, and HTML templates. And they're not tied to any one particular framework. It's core browser technology. Um, we'll dig into each of these three things uh, as we go along. Uh, but this is an example of a uh, web component here. It is a, a card component from uh, a library, uh, generic Drupal web components, um, where we've built out some of these components we'll be talking about today. Um, so we're in this JavaScript file, we're just loading a, uh, some JavaScript for the component library and a style sheet. And then in this HTML uh, document, we just have some markup. And you'll see that there is this gdwc-card custom element that comes from the library. And we can pass in some attributes to it, like the uh, image source. Uh, there's a headline here. And if I update uh, the attribute that gets passed in, it re-renders. Um, so all of that uh, gets passed in and results in this card being displayed on the screen. And you also see that it has some of its own uh, styling. Uh, associated with it, and there's a, a you know a, a paragraph here below it that's part of the main DOM, um, and there's no styling on this page otherwise. Uh, it's just the default browser styling, um, so all of the those styles come along with this web component. And now let's look at that same component in a few different contexts. So that was just an HTML document. This is a screenshot of the same card in, in Drupal, in this case, a, a sub-theme of Olivero, and uh, it looks the same, uh, except in this case, we're passing in data from our Drupal articles. And this is a, a quick look at some of the things uh, that make that possible. So in Drupal, we have to create a library to load, uh, again, the style sheet and the JavaScript, in this case, both from a CDN. And then in our article teaser twig templates, uh, it's basically just a twig template that you may be familiar with uh, in Drupal, but we can use that custom element, the, the card element as we see here. But 
we can do all of the Drupal things that we know and love, or, or, or may or may not know and love. <laughs> um, so we can use uh, attributes. We can pass in data from Drupal, obviously. We can use Drupal's uh, twig filters. Um, we just have this new uh, HTML element that we can work with. And then uh, this is an uh, example of the same component in a JavaScript framework. Uh, in this case, it's Vue. So if we look at our uh, single file view component here, um, view in single file component uses a, a template. So within our template, we have the same custom elements, uh, passing in data through attributes. We're loading the JavaScript and the style sheet. And uh, it looks the same, looks as we would expect. So the same component, very portable, um, can use it in a whole bunch of different contexts, and it looks and behaves the same, which is awesome. So uh, from my perspective, there are a, a number of things that are great about web components. Um, the big one for me is that these are core web APIs. You know, they're things built into the browser now. Um, and you know, the JavaScript frameworks fall in and out of fashion, even within a framework like React. APIs change, new features come along, uh, but this is something that is you know, tied into the browser. It has w really wide browser support now. Essentially, all evergreen browsers support this, um, especially now that Internet uh, Explorer IE11 is finally officially dead. Um, and uh, the, the Shadow DOM, which we'll talk about in, in greater detail, um, but is what really allows these to be truly encapsulated. It, it's how we saw that card that looked exactly the same regardless of the different contexts we used it in. Um, and really does start to get to that, that dream of having a front-end component that you can write once and use everywhere. Um, but, you know, it's not without its challenges. Uh, so a few things that are potential cons from my perspective uh, about web components. One is that the ergonomics of, of writing these, in, you know, my personal opinion here, are a little rough without using a supporting library. You can definitely create web components using just vanilla JavaScript, um, but what uh, a library like Lit gives you is things like templating and a number of helper functions that uh, you know, means you don't have to write as much boilerplate code, and it really just brings the experience in line with more with what I'm familiar with working on the front end. So I, I essentially always use Lit alongside uh, web components. Uh, styling can be unintuitive, and we'll dig into that a, a little bit, but it, it's really just because there are new concepts introduced here and ways to scope things to your web component that are different from the global nature of CSS that many of us are, are probably familiar with. Um, so you kind of have to think a little bit differently about what the possibilities are here. Um, Kind of goes back to the, the ergonomics, but it, it, it you know because this is a core browser technology, um, it's not going to have the same developer experience of like starting with a framework or spinning up a site using like Next.js, for example. Um, they don't have any opinions. Web components don't have any opinions about bundlers or things like that. Uh, in fact, you may not actually have to bundle uh, your web components. Um, and then also there are some challenges related to server-side rendering uh, as well, which we'll, we'll also talk about more. But uh, web components are, at the end of the day, JavaScript. So for them to be fully interactive, the JavaScript needs to load uh, on the page. Um, there are some things and some evolving features that are kind of changing the, the game there, but um, it's definitely something that still is gaining adoption and uh, you know, there's uh, lessons that need to be learned there. But I'm fairly confident at this point that on an infinite time scale, um, this concept of browser native components will be an important part of, of how we build for the web. Um, the thing that I've wondered is like how much this particular version of web components will evolve and change along the way. Um, I'm becoming more and more confident that this kind of is the, the version of web components that will evolve and be part of you know, the browser native approach to this. Um, previously, I wasn't quite as convinced. Um, but in the, uh, the current timescale, 
I think that more and more you're going to be using web components even if you don't intend to. <laughs> uh, and more and more of the sites that you use on the web are, are just going to have web components as part of them. Um, for example, if you reach for a, uh, a component on NPM, um, it may be even if it's something that you're trying to use with React, that it still is a web component behind the scenes. And uh, the fact that you don't necessarily have to care about that is actually pretty great. So uh, there's obviously a whole lot more uh, that could be talked about related to web components. Uh, I have uh, given a talk just on that topic. This is a link to one from a past a couple days. Uh, Andy, who's been kicking around here, he also gave a great talk on this topic at uh, New England Drupal Camp this past year. That's another great one to track down. But uh, let's uh, ask a few more what if questions. So. I mentioned the decoupled menus initiative uh, at the start. And uh, as part of that, um, in a past DrupalCon, a number of developers got together and uh, wanted to work on creating front end components that were going to consume data from this new uh, Drupal endpoint that was being developed. Um, so uh, the question that I asked, being someone who was interested in web components and wanted to get more hands-on experience, was uh, what, what if we made a Drupal menu web component? What would that look like? So uh, this is what it ended up looking like. Um, this is something, a component in that same library that we've been looking at. And uh, you know, it's intentionally uh, kind of unstyled so that it's possible to override the look and feel here to get it match, uh, to match the rest of what you're working with. Um, Mobile view here, but you know if we uh, we can expand and collapse the menu, um, you know pretty traditional uh, menu behavior. Same sort of deal here that we're loading the uh, JavaScript for the components and some styles, and then in the HTML document here uh, we have a new custom element gdwc menu and a number of associated attributes. So we have the branding that shows up in, you know, as the title of the menu. The base URL is probably the more interesting part here, and that is the, the root of your Drupal instance. It's where this component you know, reaches out to get its menu data. So based on, on that, it talks to Drupal, it gets all the menu data back, parses it, and renders it out on the screen like we see here. Um, to know what menu it's working with, you provide a menu ID, so I can change this to account, and I'll see that it went to Drupal and got the account menu because I'm not authenticated, it's just a login link. Um, and then also, make it back to main, so there's a little bit more to it. Um, but there's also a theme attribute that can have an impact on the, the look and feel here, so if we don't use horizontal, the default is uh, even lighter styling, but some expand and collapse interactivity. But we can also say uh, unstyled. Um, and that has uh, no styling at all, just the markup as an unordered list. So you can do with it as you want. Um, so creating a component like this that you know handles the work of talking to Drupal um, makes it a lot easier to take advantage of that endpoint and uh, a quick way to have a, a menu component that you can use on your site. Um, in working with that, it seemed like an exciting prospect, so wanted to, to look forward and you know, how can we make more components that could work like this and live uh, in this library. That, that's how the generic Drupal web components project came to be. Um, but as we tried to build more of these things, we found that uh, the, some of the approaches we took with that menu component proved kind of hard to scale. Um, so that leads us to some more of the, uh, some more what if questions we asked. So what if we wanted to restyle uh, these components? And we looked at some of the ways that we could do that, but uh, there are a variety of other options. Um, all the examples we're gonna be looking at are uh, on the storybook, on the Drupal uh, GitLab pages for this project. Um, so you can go play around uh, to your heart's content but we'll look at the menu component in Storybook here. Yes. All right, so uh, this is the same menu component that we we're looking at and, and talking about. Um, we already talked about the theme attribute as one way that um, we can affect the look and feel of this. Um, but you know, our goal here was to make it something that 
had at least some default structure, but could be overwritten to fit into a, a bunch of different sites. So there's some other ways with web components that, you, that, that can be made possible. Um, and I guess the other thing to say explicitly is that the styling for this component uses uh, the shadow DOM in, in these web components. And that is essentially, for the component, its own little version of the DOM uh, that is separate from the, the main DOM for the page. And if you uh, attach styles to the shadow DOM, in general, there are some exceptions we'll talk about, but uh, basically styles don't leak in and don't leak out. Nothing comes in, nothing comes out. Um, so that gives you the ability to you know, create a component that has a very opinionated set of styles that will always look the same no matter where you shove it. <laughs> um, so uh, some other ways that you can make it possible to uh, interact with things, styles in the shadow DOM, or change their look and feel here. There is the concept of uh, a shadow part. So in your markup, you can define a, a part. In this case, there's a menu level and menu item. And that allows you to actually say, you know, actually, there's this piece of my markup in the shadow DOM. And you actually can reach in here and style this and change it however you want. So you can use a selector like this, uh, part, menu level. And that allows us to give these ugly styles here that make it pink and have uh, dotted borders and everything. There also is uh, the idea of a slot uh, within uh, web components. So slot's a good name for it. It's a, it's a place where you can put markup. Uh, there is a default slot, but you can also name uh, slots as well. Um, and what is uh, unique about slots is that the markup that goes into a slot is part of the traditional DOM outside of the component. So that means that styles from your main document uh, do come along for the ride here and can affect what is in a slot. Um, so this is an example of uh, a branding slot within this component. So as you can see here, we can completely override you know, the header of this menu, uh, pass in whatever markup we want, and make it crazy. Um, and then also, uh, web components are JavaScript classes at the end of the day. So if the component allows it, um, there are also ways that you can extend that component and override the, you know, the render method, the styles, essentially anything you want. Um, so uh, by extending these components, that you know, the sky can potentially be the limit. But that is uh, really kind of. <laughs> breaking the glass, uh, an extreme measure to, to get in and style this thing. And then one other thing that we uh, looked at as ways that we could control uh, or give ways to control the look and feel of these components is using uh, CSS custom properties or, or custom variables. So uh, another exception, another way that you can reach into a web component and affect its styling is uh, any inherited properties will uh, pierce the shadow DOM. Is the, the fancy way, the fancy web component way to say that. Um, so you know things like uh, colors and uh, font family, um, but also CSS variables are inherited. So that's another way that you could define uh, variables that are part of your component or part of a component library, as we'll see in a bit, um, that you can use. Uh, at the entire document, but also within the individual web components. So we did, uh, with the menu experiment, with adding a few different uh, variables that are, are recognized by the components. All right, so uh, back to the slides here. Um, so that is, you know, I, I talked about the fact that this might be unintuitive. Um, it definitely was for me learning some of these options. Uh, there are many, many options uh, as far as ways that you can allow people to reach in and uh, affect the styling of these things. And a lot of them require maybe too much responsibility for the person using the component. Um, there also is the option of just not using the shadow DOM at all. You could not use that feature and make the styling global. But you know, it's a trade-off. You lose uh, some of that uh, scoping and nice, neat packaging of your component by doing that. Um, but all of these options that we talked about, you know, if we are using the Shadow DOM, do require like intentionally exposing some sort of hook. 
uh, that people can interact with to change the look and feel of the component. Um, so we talked about a handful of them, uh, including, uh, well, we didn't talk about classes. Uh, it's another approach. You can just uh, use a traditional class on your custom element and in your styles react to that value. Um, but uh, in working more with this library, where we kind of gravitated to was using uh, CSS custom properties as much as we can. Um, and that also seems to be a common approach in similar web component libraries that I've seen. Um, some reasons for that, uh, one that we talked about is that these are inherited, so it um, really gives you a, a level playing field in that you could set, for example, like your font stack at the root of the document, and that's going to affect styling outside of your components, styling inside of your components. Um, but you still have to define those variables and, and create this system uh, of a way to affect their styling. Which leads uh, to this library, OpenProx, uh, that uh, we came across in, in working on some of these components. And uh, this, is, this is my, my opinion, my, my spicy take here. But um, I think of OpenProx as like tailwind, just the good parts. <laughs> um, and why I say that is uh, because um, you know, I definitely understand why uh, Tailwind is really attractive to certain types of developers, and they like that uh, atomic classes and managing that all in markup. For me, I learned how to uh, you know, uh, work on the front end, style things differently using CSS. So it's just really not the way my brain works, and it kind of breaks my flow. Um, so I'm not as efficient using it. but the thing that I do think is really amazing about Tailwind is the design tokens that are part of the system that allow you to customize Tailwind and you know, uh, specify what the, the color scheme is and your spacing scale and all of that. Um, so I actually think that is an incredibly useful piece of Tailwind. And OpenProps is a library that, that is just that second part. Um, so it is a set of uh, CSS variables for things like uh, colors and typography, a spacing scale, fancy CSS animations um, that you can then use and, and update. Um, so taking something like this and incorporating it into our uh, library here opened up some interesting possibilities. Um, also another detail about uh, OpenProps is that they provide also a default style sheet that gives you a default look and feel. There's a version that uh, is for the traditional DOM and also a version that's scoped to the shadow DOM, which was a feature that we requested and they added, which is awesome. Um, but yeah, so these are CSS variables, so they can be defined anywhere and they'll cascade. Um, and that allows uh, a system like this to have uh, you know, this set of tokens and the components can all opt into the, these variables and use them globally across the design system. So uh, we will look at another example in Storybook here, look back at the card uh, that we've seen a little bit. And uh, yeah, so this is the, the card we've seen before, um, but now there are a handful of CSS variables uh, that are exposed here in Storybook. And we can go pretty quickly um, and change the look and feel of this card pretty drastically. So we could say we're gonna use a different font stack, we're going to use mono, we can set the heading color to, I don't know, grape. Um, it's also pretty easy with all of these controls to uh, get yourself in some trouble from like an accessibility standpoint, so you have to be careful. But uh, we can change the uh, background surface for the card, let's, I don't know, we'll just make it a different variation of gray. Uh, add a border radius, round things out a little bit, shadow, box shadow there. So uh, maybe a little extra padding. It looks crowded. Um, so uh, maybe not necessarily the, uh, the prettiest thing in the world that we ended up with, but uh, very quickly just adjusting the values of those variables throughout the system. It can really drastically affect uh, the style of this thing. And they can be, those values can be shared by other components. So if you, know, you want all of your headers to be grape, you can set that in one place and have it cascade down. And if we uh, just reset everything, uh, it goes you know, back to the, the version of the card it was. Uh, 
with a very different look. Um, and this is just one, one more example of, uh, you know, the power of uh, those variables. So this is our, our view application uh, that we saw before with the card. Um, Depending on, uh, you know, if you are a uh, detail-oriented front-end developer or not, um, it might be killing you that the, the, the fonts are a little bit different in the card compared to the rest of the application. Um, but, uh, you know, we can use this uh, one of these variables again. So we'll briefly break the entire application. <laughs> Um, but we can use our font family variable and just set it to match what view is using here. And this uh, is at the root of the application. So if we set that, that cascades down into our component and things match much more nicely. So, um, also, you know, thinking of the ways that these components could play nice with Drupal, um, we start to get into uh, the data end of things and, and what we do with the data that, that comes back from Drupal's endpoints. So, um, you know, what if this was a system of components that could work with any data, right? They don't necessarily have to be tied directly to Drupal, um, but optionally knew a few things about Drupal um, to make our life a little bit easier if we're working with Drupal as a backend here. So let's look at the link component uh, in the system here. So uh, a link on its own, creating a custom element for a link, uh, doesn't really give you a lot because you can just use markup for a link. Um, but that's what we're looking at here. We have uh, you know all the same attributes. We can pass in our href, title, target, attribute, all that stuff. Um, but again, you probably wouldn't use this on its own. Uh, however, uh, you know, imagine a situation where you have a link field in, in Drupal and you're using this uh, on a decoupled site. So you talk to JSON API and you get a response back that has the data for the link field. Uh, if you're just using a regular link, you would have to do some work to get the right pieces of that link object and figure out, okay, this is the href. I probably need to adjust it a little bit because there's some Drupalisms that come along. Um, you basically have to do the work to parse it out, pass it into your link. So this was a situation where, um, you, know, you know, what if we added some, some special Drupal smarts uh, into this, this version of a link? So we added uh, this data attribute here, and uh, that allows you to pass in a, uh, the link object. So this is just the, the data for a link field from JSON API, and the um, component will just take that and parse that out and render the link using that information. So uh, you can just use this custom element for a, a Drupal link, and you don't have to worry about parsing and managing that information as it comes in. So this is a little more detail on what that actually looks like behind the scenes. Um, so within the, uh, the render method here, um, we check to see if the data attribute exists. And if it does, we just run this process data function. And then after that runs, we are just rendering out the markup for a link, um, but with the values either that get parsed out or values that are passed in as attributes. And uh, this is the process data function. It is not doing very much at all. Um, but just a little bit of parsing of the URI to take out things that only make sense in a Drupal context so that the links can be used. Um, and then also if the title uh, is in the data object, it just sets it on the component. So yeah, I think that's a case where a, a more of those helpers uh, can continue to simplify some of the uh, integration of complex fields from Drupal. Um, and then that kind of gets to the, the next piece of working with uh, data from Drupal in a, a decoupled context here. Um, so what if we wanted to, you know, we're not talking about just a menu, for example. What if we had application data that we get back from Drupal, you know, for a whole page? How can we manage that data across 
a variety of different components in a system like this. So this is our uh, menu uh, component again. And the thing that is uh, you know, most relevant here is the base URL. So, uh, and I guess the, uh, the menu ID as well. So that's uh, by passing that in, the component again talks to Drupal's menu API and gets all the data that it needs and renders it on the screen. This is uh, a little bit of a look at what's actually happening here. You know, not the most complicated uh, JavaScript in the world, but still, you know, stuff that you would have to manage yourself. So it takes the base URL and the menu ID and uses that to figure out which endpoint it should be talking to. Uses fetch uh, to get the data from the endpoint. Parses it as JSON. There's some light error handling. And then uh, it actually uh, denormalizes the, the response from that endpoint. Uh, and converts it into something hierarchical that more closely represents a menu that you can more easily render out in your component. So, uh, you know, it's nice that it can, uh, you know, this is all kind of baked into the component and uh, people don't have to write this code. However, uh, we found pretty quickly and somewhat unsurprisingly that, you know, that approach doesn't scale uh, if you try to apply it to a number of uh, components in a design system. So. Uh, thinking of our card again, if you have one card on the screen, that's one API call. Uh, you might already have the menu there. You've got 10 cards, 10 API calls, uh, 100, or an infinite scroll. You've got some serious problems. Um, and you know, the way to solve that is to you know, deal with that data, the, the application state, at a higher level. Um, but you know, that, again, is just something that the developer would have to manage themselves. So, is there a way that we can allow these components in a system like this uh, to share that data in a common way? So uh, certainly a, a bit of a rabbit hole, but uh, that led to uh, work on this library, uh, Drupal State, which is a, uh, so at the time, there really weren't uh, too many uh, clients for uh, Drupal's JSON API out there. Uh, there are certainly more now, including this Drupal State uh, project, and they, they all do somewhat similar things. Um, but the idea with this library is that it's uh, framework agnostic, so you can use it on the client side or the server side. Uh, it is a way that you can interface with JSON API, make a request to Drupal's API, and then it gets stored in local, uh, a local cache so that the next time you need to get an article from your Drupal site, it'll check the cache first, and return that without making an API call. Um, and it also does uh, deserialize and simplify the response uh, that we get back from JSON API as well. And uh, more on, there's more on this library, a uh, talk that I gave at a past DrupalCon about uh, how more of this works and some of the decisions that came into this, uh, if you're interested. But uh, this is just a quick uh, look in a little bit more detail about what using that actually looks like. So we uh, import uh, the library and then uh, create an instance of a store here, and we pass in the API base. Uh, you can also pass in an API prefix, uh, set a locale. There's a handful of other options. But with the store, that allows us to do something like this. So we can say uh, await store and then get object, uh, which allows us to get a uh, particular object from JSON API. In this case, we're saying that it, the object name is node recipe. So that will give us all of the recipes uh, from that JSON API endpoint. And then, so it's obviously going to make an API call for that, but then store it in the local cache. And then if we later ask for a particular recipe by providing the ID, uh, it will just return that from uh, local state, and it doesn't have to make uh, an API request. And then also, as you'll see here, um, it, you know, you'll probably only notice this if you have worked with responses from JSON API, but uh, the data is uh, a little bit flatter. You don't have to uh, traverse like attributes or deal with uh, relationships for entity references. It's a little bit easier to get at uh, the data. So, 
uh, with a, a, a client like that and a consistent way to talk to, to JSON API, now this gives us a thing that we could use in uh, a design system like this. So uh, taking a, a next step from there, what if we created a web component that could source data from Drupal itself? Which is uh, what we see here. So to achieve this, we introduced a, a couple of additional components. Uh, the first is the store. And you know, these are basically interfaces into the, the uh, Drupal state client that we saw. Um, but here we pass in things like the root of our Drupal instance. And then inside of a store, there can be one or more providers. And that is kind of similar to that get object call that we saw, but um, that makes a call out to JSON API or, or checks the, the local store uh, to get data back. And then any data that is returned to the provider um, is available to a template. So we have this uh, HTML template here, and we're using the card component that we've been working with in our, our examples. Um, but also it can be any markup. So it could be other custom elements. It could be regular old HTML, like we see down here at the bottom. Um, and then also it ha you know, has access to that data. So you'll see here that we're using the summary field. Uh, the title is a placeholder, but we could instead uh, replace that and use a uh, twig-like curly braces and just say title. And now we have our, our deep Mediterranean quiche title. Um, I'll just get rid of the non-card markup here. Um, so the provider here is asking for a particular recipe by ID. Um, if we got rid of that and the provider gets multiple results, um, it will iterate over the template for every result it gets back. So you see here that there are all of our recipes represented as cards. And then uh, this is just a markup at the end of the day in this template. It's an HTML template. So we can also do things like add a uh, style element here. And uh, you know, a few lines of CSS here uh, give us a two-column grid. And then you know, we were looking at our uh, custom properties before that are part of the system. So we could also define a few variables to just tweak uh, the look and feel of our cards here in a grid. So I think there's uh, definitely more uh, to experiment with here. But um, I, I think the idea of being able to have an interface to Drupal and you know, essentially a, a generic template to put whatever you want in it, um, all that you can handle in markup is uh, pretty cool. All right, so uh, a few last things as uh, we wrap up here, a couple last what if questions. Uh, what if we wanted this project to be sustainable? Uh, so it, I think it needs to be a uh, community effort and, uh, and not a solo project. Part of that is uh, you know, because of uh, limited time, but also, really, if the idea here is to create a set of components that can be useful for people working with Drupal, it really needs to represent uh, use cases for a variety of people who are going to work with Drupal, and not just what one dude thinks are cool components. Uh, so there's a meta issue uh, for that on the project. Um, so if there are components that you think would be useful with a library like this, uh, would love to, to hear from you. There's also, it's kind of a, also a dumping ground of interesting web component libraries that we could be inspired by. Uh, also, if you feel like getting hands-on, uh, the project does have a uh, scaffolder. So you can run this npm run create component command, and that will create uh, a component for you that has an entry in storybook and hooks into this theming system. So if there's something you'd love to build, uh, I'd, I'd love, to, love to see you do it. Uh, or if you're just looking for an easy way to maybe dip your toe in and experiment with web components and lit, uh, that might be a fun way to do it. And then, uh, la last one, getting a little, get a little lofty here. Uh, what if we wanted to make an important impact for the PHP community? Um, we talked uh, way in the beginning uh, about server-side rendering and how that works with, uh, with web components. So again, these are JavaScript components at the end of the day. So they uh, need to, JavaScript needs to load on your page for them to be fully interactive. 
If you're not careful, that can result in things like things jumping around on the page, obviously would potentially cause problems if JavaScript doesn't load on your page. Um, however, uh, there is a new feature uh, of web components called declarative shadow DOM. These names are just so good. <laughs> um, but uh, and it, it, it's gaining browser adoption. I think actually it's, uh, it's been in Chrome and Edge for a while. Uh, it just shipped in the Safari technical preview, and I believe Firefox is officially working on it as well. So the browser adoption is coming along. Uh, but basically, what that allows you to do is uh, create a web component in such a way using a, a template, like we saw, uh, in server rendered code, so that when it uh, loads in the browser, it will automatically mount your web component without any JavaScript. So um, there still is you know, uh, full interactivity that can happen when the component does fully load, but it allows uh, you know, a representation of your component to load even if JavaScript isn't being used on the page. So it really is more of a true server-side rendering for these types of components, which obviously, uh, given the way Drupal works, uh, that would open up some really interesting possibilities. But the problem is that a lot of the solutions for that today uh, all use Node. So there's a, a number of Node packages that can be used to server-render server web components in this way. Um, so I'm not exactly sure how that gets solved in the context of PHP. Maybe it isn't really a solvable problem in a practical way. I, I don't know. Uh, but if we could figure out a way to do it, I think it would be really great for Drupal, really great for PHP in general, great for web components. Um, so I just think that's an interesting problem that who knows, maybe, fingers crossed, we could find a way to make some progress on. And also do uh, want to take a second to thank uh, all of uh, the folks uh, that have contributed uh, as well. And I'm not sure if you're on there, so uh, you are the anyone I missed <laughs> in the list. Um, but yeah, to any of these related projects, um, we've had some great contributions and would love to have some more in the future. Um, and what if the talk was over, but you had some questions? I think we have just a few minutes for questions, if anybody has any. Yes. How the, heck, how the heck does like server side web components work? Like, do you still have the custom element, or and, and the browser knows about it? Or? Yeah. The great, great question. How the heck does server side web components work? Um, so, uh, I can show an example here. So basically, at the end of the day. What you have to do is uh, render the markup that you want server-side rendered in, in a template here. And if you specify a shadow root, the value can be open or closed. Um, the uh, declarative shadow DOM knows what to do with that in the browser when it sees that on the page. So in this example, uh, I guess this is maybe isn't a great example because there's not a lot of real markup in there. Um, Is there a good example of that? Yeah, I guess the button is good enough. Um, so in this case, uh, if you weren't server-side rendering this, the button that's in included in this menu to toggle would not display on the page until JavaScript loaded. But if you provide the template here, it will render the markup for the button like any HTML markup. And then anything that does require JavaScript, so if you have like uh, event listeners or you know, anything that progressively enhances it, that will happen when the JavaScript loads. Um, so it, it is, I, I hesitate to say it is that simple, but it's that simple. Like if you provide the markup in a template, it will render it regardless of if there is JavaScript or not. And it does have all of the features of web components like the shadow DOM and, and all of that stuff. The, the problem is that for a more complicated component, um, it, it's hard to render everything. And those node packages, what a lot of them do is, is it actually will like mount the component to see what the markup is and spit that out in the server rendered code. The way 
without a package like that for Drupal, I, I think we would basically just have to, you know, have the full markup. And at that point, what are you really getting there? So very, very long-winded answer to that question, but hopefully useful. Yes? But for something like uh, trying to reuse uh, your web components between like Twig and like Angular and things like that, do you feel like you wind up having to rewrite huge chunks of the thing to you use stuff like entity attributes or like for loops or things like that that are more complex for different systems? Not really. Um, because at the end of the day, like this is just a uh, markup. Like it, it behaves like a regular HTML element. Um, so you can pass in whatever attributes to it that you want. The only real exception there is that some frameworks play nicer with web components than others. And uh, when I say some frameworks, I mean uh, React is the problem <laughs> in this case. Uh, most uh, of the frameworks, you can just use web components and they'll, they can pick up on the state and listen to events and all that stuff. React has been lagging behind. Uh, I believe in the, the current experimental version of React, they, they have finally addressed that. Um, so hopefully that will make it into React. There also have been a lot of uh, work to solve that problem outside of React. So Lit has an experimental package for React uh, that essentially allows you to automatically create a wrapper around your web component that then lets React listen to events in the web component and, and all of that stuff. So uh, again, it might sound too good to be true, but because at the end of the day, this is just a new element, a new piece of markup that you can use in your application, usually you don't have to do a lot of bending backwards for the frameworks. Any other questions? Cool. Thanks, everybody. This was fun. Happy to talk more uh, throughout the weekend. <laughs>